very warm welcome to all participants of today's IS speaker event. I hope all of you are doing uh, well and are ready for the weekend. My name is Matthias and I will be today's host. Um, having said that, I'm super happy to welcome uh, Zach Dichtwa uh, live from New York City. Uh, good morning, Zach, and a uh, pleasure to have you today. Um, Thanks so much before, for having me. Hey, everybody. Before I probably introduce our guest, let me briefly, as always, say a few words about the Asian European Society in Munich. Uh, we are a nonprofit Munich based um, student society that aims to foster mutual understanding among students from Asia and Europe. And therefore, our team of roughly 30 people organizes a broad range of events such as today's one. So, so to all the Munich students out there, um, I highly encourage you to reach out to us in case you want to be part of this community. We will also have tomorrow at 2 p.m. an info session on how to contribute at AES. So feel free to check our website for registration, aesmooc.de. Um, that being said, for those of you who do not know Zach yet, I would say a, uh, some brief sentences about him to introduce him. Uh, so I hope you do not mind if I quickly read it out. So after graduating from Columbia University in 2012, um, Zach dealt most of the last decade with um, China. He traveled for four years, thousands of miles through the country, interviewing um, locals and realized thereby that uh, the China we often talk about in the West is far different than the China he first hand experienced. And based on his in-depth experience, the fluent Mandarin speaker um, then wrote in 2018 his best-selling book, Young China, which has been also featured in um, some leading publications such as Wall Street Journal, BBC, uh, Washington Post, and so on. Uh, interestingly, the book will also soon be available in German language. So in case some of you are curious um, after the session uh, and prefer reading it in German, you can check it out. Um, yeah, and today, uh, Zach is founder and CEO of the Young China Group, a uh, think tank and consultancy designed to create some understanding between the East and Western millennials for, for um, individuals, companies, and government. Um, besides that, he's also a frequent speaker, uh, has a great TED Talk I can highly recommend to you guys, and also published quite some cool um, content via um, newsletter on his website, youngchinagroup.com. Um, before we start with our conversation, um, let me finally elaborate on the structure of today's session. So Zach will start off by giving a brief 10, 15 minutes keynote on some of his key messages uh, on China these days uh, before we go over um, to the open Q&A. And I've prepared some questions beforehand, but I want to highly encourage all of you um, to actively participate by um, submitting your questions by using the, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And uh, in fact, Zach especially emphasized um, that he's very keen on receiving some, uh, quote, spicy audience questions. Um, so please do not um, disappoint our guests. Uh, again, Zach, pleasure to have you today here. Uh, we really appreciate your time and we are excited um, to hear your thoughts. So I would hand over and you can start the screen sharing. Perfect. Um, before I do start the screen sharing, I, I want to first say hello, hey everybody. Um, I'm sure you can see that I am not in China right now. I've been stuck uh, in the United States since early January. I was here for a conference um, and then was going to go back to China for Chinese New Year. On I think it was January 23rd, I was going to fly to Wuhan. Um, my plans changed. And so for the last bunch of months, uh, I have been in the United States uh, and in New York City. So um, I was really hoping to actually be in Germany right now. My book was supposed to come out um, recently, uh, or in a, in a, actually a couple of weeks ago in Germany. Uh, so I wish I could be there with all of you. I wish this was a, a more uh, in-person conversation. But knowing some of the people who are taking part today, and it's a more intimate discussion, uh, one of the really cool parts is that people can come in from all over the world. So. Uh, I want to start with an idea that I don't always talk about, uh, but because it's a global audience today, I wanted to lean into this. Um, it's a phrase that I really like, and it's pi gu jue ding nao dai. It's internet slang, and it means your butt determines your brain. So where you sit in the world, wherever you all are beaming in from right now, who's around you, the media ecosystem that you're in, the sort of chatter you've heard growing up, um, uh, maybe the political beliefs of your parents, of your family, basically, you know, who's sitting around you to a much greater degree than we'd like to admit to ourselves determines the way that we see the world. One of the really cool things of the last few years for me 
is I, I've now gotten to speak on six continents uh, on the topic of young China and China itself. And everywhere I go, I see that the way that people in that place view China uh, is both similar to that place as well as different from everywhere else in the world. So before we start, I, this is my first speech I get to do in Germany. Um, so I'm gonna ask everyone to do me a really huge favor. And that is two things. First, when I say the word China, what is the first word that comes to your mind? Please write this word into the q and I'm actually asking you to actively use your fingers and type words into the Q&A uh, so that we could take a look at this uh, later in the discussion. So now everyone take a second to do it. If you do not do it, Matthias is going to kick you out of the conversation. He's not gonna do that. Five seconds. Very first thing, by the way, there's no wrong answers. It could be illness, it could be virus, it could be you know, anger, what, 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 whatever you're feeling right now, it's, it's totally okay. The so second thing I want already you got to do, more than 10 10 replies, so uh, right. perfect. We're gonna, keep, we're gonna keep moving then. The second thing I'm gonna ask you to do is write the one question you have about young China now. So I'm gonna say a lot of stuff and it might change the way you see the world, hopefully. Um, but before that, I wanna know what you're thinking before the conversation even starts. So please write that one question into the Q&A and then hopefully in the conversation uh, as it progresses, and I really want today to be more of a conversation. Um, digitally of course but i will will start to approach those questions so i'm going to wait for five seconds i want everybody to write your question into the q a and i'm going to take a look right now we got some interesting ones trump fast change china huge powerful really interesting okay really interesting so i'm going to start and um, the one thing I would encourage you to remember is in the spirit of your butt determining your brain, the goal of the next 15 minutes is to, is to get you to shift even just a little bit. So is to get you to lift your, you know, we've now been sitting in the same seat at home for a few months, to, to lift your butt out of that seat and try to see what the world may look like from a seat in China. That's all. So, so put aside your baggage, put aside the, the, the boredom, maybe the fatigue, um, the fear of the last few months, uh, and let's try to imagine what the world looks like from a seat in China, okay? So the question I always like to start with, and I'm gonna start sharing my screen, is how well equipped are you to understand young China? Not how well do you understand young China, but what is your actual equipment to understand young China? Uh, do you speak the language? What's your, what's your news sources? Uh, what kind of contacts do you have in the country? And how is young China different than old China? And I'll explain those two ideas in a second. Um, first, a little bit about me. I know this was just brought up. I spent most of the last decade in China. Um, I did not go as an academic. I went as a uh, kid running away from the consulting business in the United States. Uh, and then, of course, my, my interest became more substantial. Uh, I spent most of my time in second and third tier cities, not intending to write a book, um, eventually getting towards this research. My goal was to get as deep into China as possible. I realized very quickly that the China we often describe to the world or that we interact with here in New York or maybe there in Munich or, or across Germany is much different than the China that I was seeing on the ground. And it's often a difference in perspective. Outside of China, we focus on two different versions. One is big government, right, which is scary, and we're seeing a lot of that recently. Uh, the second is a big economy, which is exciting, and then sometimes also scary. Uh, I was interested in kind of neither of those at the beginning. I was interested in China on the ground, the China I was interacting with every day, particularly the Chinese, uh, the China of the younger generation versus the older generation. Uh, there's a saying in Chinese, wu chao bu cheng shu, wu chao bu cheng shu. It means without uh, accidents, without accidents, there are no books. So after years of accidents and research um, throughout China, I, I was lucky enough to come out with Young China that came out two years ago and should be coming out in Germany soon. So let's really get into it. Why should you care about Young China? 
you might not know the answer, by the way. Uh, there's a lot of things that people want you to care about. Uh, I would argue that everyone needs to know about Young China because it's going to be impacting you personally. When I say Young China, I mean two things. First, I'm talking about young people. So there's 417 million millennials in China, a uh, lot of young people. Second, I'm talking about the, by the way, I think this is more interesting. I'm referring to the new version of China that we're starting to see on the world stage today. I'm referring to this idea that most of the time when we look at China, we look at the older generations, we look at an old style of government. Uh, we look at old stereotypes around uh, maybe ways of doing business or ways of interacting with the world. But there's a new generation that is coming up, a new version of China that's expressing itself on the world stage that is far different than those old stereotypes. And by the way, it's likely these young people who are going to be defining uh, or guiding the step of this new version of China that we see on the world stage today. So caring about young people is really important. Um, for those of you who are business minded, I was told by a German friend in, in, in China today who works at a, he's at, Mer he's at a BMW. Uh, he told me, make sure to talk about business with this crowd because this is a very practical crowd. So I'm gonna go into two businesses really quickly. I'm gonna do this light speed just so you can start to see the potential for impact. Again, backing up real quick to populations. This is the millennial population of North America, Europe, and the Middle East. Um, you combine the three of those and they are still not as large as the population of just young people in China. So the potential for impact is unlike any that we've really imagined. The population of Germany is around 82 million, if I'm not mistaken, which is exactly one fifth of just the young population in China. So the potential for impact is massive. And then as we've seen over the years, uh, China matters more now. Look, if, if 20 years ago we were having this conversation, it might be academic. 2003 in the SARS outbreak, China represented only 4% of the global population. Today, they're nearly 20%, excuse me, of, of global GDP. They're nearly 20%. So we don't have an option anymore. So I don't care if you think China is, is the best thing in the world or the worst thing in the world, it doesn't matter. You need to understand the dynamics of the country, the dynamics of this young population and how they're looking to exert themselves, express themselves, how they feel about the world, how they feel about their government, these things are going to start to impact you, your government, your business, your day-to-day -day personally. Let's look at tourism. I, I do some work in tourism and this one's interesting. So obviously tourism doesn't exist at the moment. Uh, and when we think of tourism, we usually think of France, UK, Germany, and the United States. Uh, and that used to be really important because they were the world's biggest tourism spenders. China is the largest tourism spender in the world. So by the way, China has closed its borders right now, more or less. So as they're not traveling abroad, think about how much that's impacting the global economy. This isn't that interesting. Let's look at growth. This is growth in outbound tourism spend over the last 10 years. Uh, the other four contenders have grown a little bit. China has grown a lot. Two thirds of all passport holders in the country are millennials. So just taking a step back, you have the majority of passport holders in one country are now the largest outbound tourism spenders in the world. And only 9% of the country has a passport, uh, which is expected to double in the next five years. So, so again, based only on what I've told you so far, uh, you have about 10% of the population with a passport. That number is gonna go to 20%, which is uh, an increase of 140 million people. And the majority of them are young people. Do you think the German tourism industry is ready for that? What about luxury? This is really interesting. So China has delivered more than half the global growth in luxury spending in the last six or seven years. Um, they're expected to deliver three quarters of global gl luxury growth uh, through 2025. Uh, and by the way, about 80% of the luxury spending is young people. So if you're looking at just these two industries, and if you're, looking at, uh, if you're looking at automotive, if you're looking at manufacturing, if you're looking at consumption around the world, it's not just China. When we talk about the Chinese market, that's actually not very accurate. We should be focusing specifically on young people. So if it's just academic, that's really great. Uh, my hope is through sort of like the pressures of capitalism and the opportunities of understanding uh, and business and collaboration, 
we are going to need to understand not just how productive this young generation is, but rather how they are going to be impacting the world in terms of what they want, what they dream of, what to them is a great vacation, how they want their cars to look, uh, what is a priority around safety, around family, uh, what does the word freedom mean to them? The psychological impacts of China speed. I, I saw on some of the early responses on some of the words, uh, people wrote really fast, right? The idea that the thing we know about China is for the last 30 years, it's grown really fast, which is true. To sort of help this come, come to life, uh, I, I always like to give this example. This is a picture of my dad. You can probably tell that we are related. I think my dad's actually on this call, by the way. So I just turned 30 recently. And if you're wondering what happens when you turn 30, your parents still watch you give speeches. So thank you to my family for joining today. Uh, this is my dad in 1969. My dad in 1969 was deciding whether or not to go to the Woodstock Music Festival. The Woodstock Music Festival is best known for three things, sex, drugs, rock and roll. Uh, based on this picture, you can guess which of those my dad was interested in. Um, you could also know a lot about my dad in terms of he, he had a little bit of extra money, right? He could buy a ticket. He, could, he had some discretionary time. He could, he could take the time off, you know? Um, he was probably rebelling against something, the war, uh, or someone, his grandparents. So just from this one decision, you can know a lot about my dad. This is America in 1969. Woodstock looks really fun. Uh, I don't think we're gonna be gathering in crowds like that anytime soon, but I wish we, uh, you know, looks, looks like a good time. This is China in 1969. China was in the middle of its cultural revolution, and this generation was best known for their ability to chew cool, to eat bitter, to do difficult things for long periods of time at the prospect of delayed gratification. One thing I want us to remember here is when we're talking about the generations that built the manufacturing economy in China, when we think of, when we think of China, we often think of manufacturing, right? Uh, what we're talking about is this generation. This is an ancient history. So this generation, when they were 20, uh, around 1979, the average education in China, only 11% of the adult population was high school educated, but they were extremely hardworking. So when you have a massive, massive population who's relatively uneducated, extraordinarily hardworking, and you start to open up the economy, it's intuitive that you push towards manufacturing. And so when you think about the manufacturing economy, instead of thinking about a government pushing China into rising out of poverty, think about this generation, the baby boomer generation in China, working extraordinarily hard, asking for extra hours at the end of the week so that they could improve their lives. By the way, this, this baby boomer generation in China, it's not ancient history. These are my friends' parents and their grandparents. They're alive today. I was born in 1990, my friend in Shanghai born in 1990. This is the Shanghai that they knew. This is 25 years later. So I, I'm not showing you this to, to get you excited about the real estate industry or, or whatever it is. I want you to imagine what would witnessing this change do to, the, do to the way that you see the world. How would it change your expectations around growth, government, Finances, opportunity, real estate prices, money. I mean, I mean, if, if you have, if, if your butt has been in a seat in Shanghai for the last 25 years and you've witnessed this change, how does that change the way that you've seen the world? To quantify this, let's look at growth in per capita GDP since I was born. So growth in per capita GDP is an okay metric to understand basically how much progress or how much financial, you know, how much wealth you've seen build uh, in, your, in your lifetime, how much growth you've seen in your lifetime. So in my lifetime, I've watched our economy, uh, our per capita GDP increase two and a half times, uh, which is pretty good for a developed economy. My friends in China, in their lifetime, have watched their per capita GDP increase 30, 31x. So more than 10x what I've witnessed in my life. What about India? India is another big economy, right? Well, just over five. Millennials there have witnessed just over 5x in terms of growth. Germany, the leader of Europe, uh, the number is 1.9. Brazil, 2.9. In fact, when you're wondering what, 
how the rest of the world looks in terms of how much growth we've witnessed in our lifetime, it kind of looks like this. If everyone's looking at this graph. You'll notice that this is, by the way, this is the amount of growth that young people around the world have witnessed in their lifetime. This is the top 60 performing economies of today. And you'll notice that most of them are the same. So like I'm sitting here in New York and if I'm wondering uh, how much growth a young person my age has witnessed in their lifetime, I could probably guess because it's pretty much the exact same amount that I've witnessed in my lifetime. Uh, and if you look at most countries around the world, you could probably guess because it's all really similar with the exception of one country, China. So when we talk about China speed, when we talk about the incredible growth of the economy, when we talk about the incredible boom of Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, when we talk about the massive progress over the last 30 years, we don't often think about what that does to this generation's worldview. And it's absolutely unique. There is no other generation on earth, especially at the massive scale that has witnessed this much change, that has lived in an ecosystem of constant change in their lifetime, period. Third point, open-minded. There's this expectation that for China, uh, it's a nation behind a wall. It's a nation insulated from the rest of the world. Uh, and that, that used to be true. This is a, um, this is a picture of, of childhood in the 1960s. This is what childhood used to look like. Uh, I have friends, parents in Guizhou province uh, who, who described the first time they saw the outside world. They went to a neighboring village, saw a 12 month calendar on the wall, fields of Europe. It was 12 pictures of the fields of Europe. That was it. Travel abroad, no way. People weren't leaving the province, let alone the country. And so people's worldview was defined by what was around them. This is what childhood looks like today. Obviously censorship exists in China. And I, and I assume there's gonna be some questions about the, the, the role of the state in informing people's ideas. Um, and you've actually seen a more robust propaganda regime over the last couple of months, especially since the virus is, has, has sort of seized the global narrative. Um, but I want you to remember that this young generation has grown up watching a lot of Western TV, uh, has grown up learning English. There's uh, 200 million English speakers in China, uh, 200 million. They've grown up listening to our music. They've grown up watching our TV. They've grown up watching our movies, trying our fashions. So I get that there's a lot of political news that they don't see, and that's true. But if you were to ask my dad from that older picture, you know, how much does the Rolling Stones, how much does the music that they listen to, the movies that they watch inform their worldview? It's pretty substantial. And I'm gonna ask everyone else here today, uh, who is your favorite Chinese rock band? Who's your favorite Chinese celebrity? What's your favorite movie that they've acted in? What about your favorite Chinese novelist? Now, I, I know this seems kind of annoying for me to ask this, but if you don't think that this matters, then you don't think that identity, that expression of self matters on a global scale. And because of the massive nature of this generation, it's absolutely important. There's another interesting thing here and that's demography. So it used to be in China that there was a lot of old people and not very many young people. Uh, in 1950, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing here for a second just so you, you guys can. In 1950, the, the per cap, uh, there was a lot of young people, very few old people. So each family had between uh, five and six kids per family. Uh, and the average life expectancy was 36 to 40 years old. So uh, I know some people in the cruise industry and there's this idea in America that when you grow up, you kind of retire and then you take a cruise. In China, you did not re retire and take a cruise because you, you die. That's what China used to look like. Now that demographic pyramid has more or less turned itself on its head. So you have very few young people because of the one child policy starting in 1980 and a lot of older people because of an incredible longevity revolution. And it's called the 421 crisis. What does the 421 crisis mean? It means having four grandparents for every two parents for every one child. And I'm gonna tell a quick story here. Um, when I was in China, I, I had a job as a teacher when I was 22. Um, I was teaching only on the weekends. Otherwise I was teaching, uh, I was just basically hustling for money so that I could travel the country. 
Um, and one of my jobs, I got to teach a small technology class um, that was geared towards sort of wealthier young people. I had uh, six five-year-olds in my class. One was named Tianguo. Tianguo had comb over hair, uh, corduroy pants, nice sort of button up shirt. He was very cute. Um, class begins, I'm thinking these kids are little emperors. I'm sure you guys have heard the term little emperors. Little emperor basically means that these kids are spoiled rotten by an excess of attention, resources, food, right? Sort of true. Uh, over the course of class, these kids though are just adorable. Um, they're curious, they work well together. Uh, Tianguo in particular is extraordinarily well-mannered and it would have been a totally normal class were not for the fact that at the back of the class behind a glass partition for those six five-year-olds, there was 12 parents and 24 grandparents watching every twist of a microscope and every tap of a keyboard. Can you imagine the pressure of that? Class ends, I leave the class and go uh, talk with some of the parents. And I hear out of the corner of my ear, Jeng will start to cry. I go over and I see that there's his four grandparents surrounding them. I see that his dad is sort of standing to the side looking kind of confused. And his mother is standing in front of them with pieces of paper. On those pieces of paper are words. Microscope. Amoeba. Cell. These are all the words that we had learned that day in class. And I asked his mom, what's going on? You know, I didn't, I didn't assign any homework. And she says, Jen Guo is studying for the college entrance exam. He has to take it in 13 years, and I am trying to give him the edge. So if we imagine this picture, this 421, we can imagine it like a funnel. It's absolutely a funnel for resources. By the way, if you're wondering how young people in China can afford to travel abroad, it's because it's also a funnel for dreams. The older generation couldn't travel abroad. They want their young generation to do it. The older generation couldn't get educated. They hope that their, their children can go study in Germany, in the United States, in the UK, in Australia. It's also a funnel for pressure. Pressure to succeed. Pressure to get ahead. Pressure to do well on the high school market the college market, the higher education market, the job market, the real estate market, and then also the marriage market. That pressure is one of the defining characteristics of this young generation. And by the way, when you think about competition on the world stage, you often think about the people around you. What we're learning now is that we're in, whether we like it or not, we're, we're in a global world. And so this young generation who has been competing, who has been pressured to, to do well, to get ahead, is soon going to be competing with you in Germany, with my friends in the United States. It's mostly been pent up in, in China right now. Soon that competitive energy is going to unleash itself on the world in a very real way. So I'm going to make this point really quick, just because I want to make sure we get to some questions. Uh, adaptation, innovation, and the world's most mobile forward generation. I'm sure everyone here knows what this graphic is. It's WeChat. Um, I want everyone here to ask themselves, do I have WeChat? Most of you might say yes at this point. Uh, do you use it for more than four hours a day? If you answered no, then you are using it below the average amount of an average user. There's this idea of China being a copycat nation, right? Uh, and in fact, the defining question for this young generation is can they transition from imitative to innovative? Can they stop being the copycat and start leading the world? Um, that question of can they be innovative, it's kind of an interesting question, right? Uh, because in a lot of ways, this young generation has had to be adaptive their whole lives. One of my favorite quotes in China, it's kind of old, uh, you hear it often in China, it's from Deng Xiaoping, uh, it's 摸着石头过河. It means crossing the river by feeling the stones, which is a beautiful way of saying we, we don't really know exactly what we're doing, right? We're on one bank, which is poverty, we're looking at the other bank, which is, which is development. Um, China's reaching with one foot, trying to, trying to pass through the river of time, trying to find uh, a way across to fjord the, fjord the path. They're expecting, and what I love about this phrase is, it shows that people are expecting to get knocked down. When you cross the river by feeling the stones, you have to adapt. In fact, the ability to adapt is written into 
sort of the thesis driving a lot of China's change over the last 20 years. And so if we think about this as government, that's fine. We should really be thinking of it as, um, as something that the people have adopted. This is, a, this is a picture of innovation and adaption. This is Lao Wang. Lao Wang is a beggar. It used to be that his industry relied on money, on loose change. Uh, he would sit waiting for loose change outside of the subway. 2015, people in China stopped carrying money. They stopped carrying hard currency. So what does he do? He goes and buys the cheapest smartphone he can afford. He prints out a QR code, which is what you see right there, and he hangs it on his neck. Now when people walk out of the subway, instead of dropping change into his jar, they take out their phone, they scan his QR code, and they donate that way. So it's not just about innovators at the top, not just about people creating stuff, it's about people willing to use it. And you could see that even though in the US and China, mobile payment was created pretty much at the, at the exact same time, the major difference in this innovation is that one country was willing to use it. So if I'm in Finland, I could have the coolest innovation in the world, but if I only have 50 users, it doesn't really matter. What's so unique about China is that they're not just, they don't just have an interesting innovation ecosystem, they have an incredible adaptation and adoption ecosystem. People are willing to change. And we've seen that, by the way, with a lot of COVID-19 response and the public's willingness to start to use technology to get the world, to get their society back on track. Okay, folks, this is the last point. I'm going to make it quick, uh, and then we're going to start to getting to some tough questions. It's the issue of pride. So a lot of people ask me, um, actually, this is the most common question I get asked. It's, okay, what about the young people who are studying in the United States from China? Once they get a taste of freedom, and that's the word people use, uh, democracy, our system, how can they go back to China's system? Um, how can they not want what we have? When is that gonna shift? So I wanna tell you a quick story, uh, and it's the story of the Olympics. And I'm gonna stop sharing here, and then we're pretty much done with the keynote, and then we're gonna get to some of your spicy questions. Uh, I have a friend named Wen Tao, he's, he's from Sichuan, he's from Pengdu, uh, which is outside of, of Chengdu. Um, he remembers the very first time he ever saw the United States. He was six years old. It was on a TV that his uncle wheeled out. It was actually the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. Everyone in his neighborhood came to watch around the same TV. Wen Pao did not have a TV in his house. He remembers his mom tapping him on the shoulder during the opening ceremony and saying, you know, Wen Pao, look, there's the United States. It's the most powerful country in the world. And to his mom, that was true. You have to remember that she had been brought up with the United States in particular uh, being sort of a city on a hill, UK and Germany as well, something to aspire to, something towards which China should strive. That year, the United States won, uh, I believe it was 44 gold medals, and China won 15. Fast forward 12 years, it's the Beijing Olympics, um, 2008. Tom, or Wen Pao, now 18 years old instead of six years old, so only 12 years has passed, he remembers watching his country that year earn 48 gold medals when the United States earns 36. How much is a gold medal worth? Honestly, not very much. You could probably buy one online today. But how much is the value of pride? You know, when we think about China, if we only think about the government and how is it possible that young people in China feel proud of the government, you're missing most of the picture because people in China don't necessarily feel proud of their government, they do to a certain extent, but they feel proud of their uncle, who when they were young was proud to bring a bicycle back home. And now just 12, 15, 16, 20 years later has a two house garage. They've watched their, their small village turn into a town, turn into a city in their lifetime. You saw the graph I posted before about the amount of change China has seen versus other places in the world. That's what they've witnessed. That's their world. And so for them, it's not being proud of the Chinese Communist Party, which you can always tell an American politician is trying to rile up anti-Chinese sentiment because he just repeats Chinese Communist Party. It's not about the party. It's about the people. And so if you're missing this people-forward perspective of China, you're missing a massive understanding of people's sense of self, of their reaction to their government, 
of their of what they want, of what it means to be proud, of what it means to be free, uh, of what it means to be cool, by the way. Because this young generation, different than older generations in China, where, where being foreign or being American or being Western from Western Europe uh, was better, this young generation is the first generation in Chinese history who feels like they're looking eye to eye with the rest of the world. And they're proud of that. So for all of those who expect that modernization, the process of becoming more modern, wealthier, uh, more technologically advanced, for those of you who expect that modernization equals westernization, we're gonna have a bit of a wake up call here because this young generation is the first generation in history from, from Asia who is large enough, you know, you saw the numbers, who has enough economic and political clout that for the first time in their lives, they don't have to fall into the Western sphere of cultural gravity. So my question to you, and this is how we're gonna end the keynote portion is, um, I know you guys are all probably anticipating some version of Westernization. Have you imagined what Easternization might look like in your town, in your city, in your family, in your business? And if not, why not? Thank you. This was pretty cool, Zach, and I forgive you that you took some, some minutes longer. Yeah, uh, no sorry. worries on that. Um, yeah, great insights. Um, again, to all participants, feel free to submit questions. We already have some. I grouped some of them, and we will go them, like we will take care of them like in a structured way. Uh, I will skip a little bit on some of the personal China experience because we already mentioned quite some. Let me just allow one question on this one. Um, like after publishing your book, you, just two years ago, you, you founded your own company, Young China Group. Can you maybe just give us a brief overview? What are you currently doing on this and, and what's your vision for this? Where should this sure. be? To? So the goal of Young China Group is to show people how uh, basically identity questions of people, you know, can drive economic and political outcomes. So we, we have a people first approach to understanding the world. Uh, and we focus on, on bridging understanding between China uh, and individuals outside of China. Uh, also within China, honestly, we work with some Chinese companies, um, but also businesses and, and governments. We honestly believe that the thing that's missing in the international narrative around China is, believe it or not, the people. And so we're trying to inject sort of that, that people forward focus into uh, different companies and governments approach and approach to an understanding of China. Cool. Thanks, Zach. Um, so let's just uh, jump right into the, the contents of your book. You already mentioned some of your hypotheses. Let me start off by, by questioning, like you, you traveled a lot around. You said you lived in different tier cities like tier one, tier two, tier three. Most of our participants uh, might know this tier system. Can you elaborate a little bit on what, like, can we really generalize it? And, and what are the similarities and what are the difference, maybe the main differences across these tier cities? Sure, across tier cities and across China, by the way, like China is 1.4 billion people. It's very large. It's very diverse. In fact, so this is my map of China today. Uh, people don't really realize how, how weird China is geographically. And I, I feel like Prague would, I know you guys had Prague re recently on this and we talked about this. Um, basically, if you were to draw a diagonal line across China, this is Harbin, so right below Russia, um, like Manchuria area. Uh, and this is Yunnan province, which is, which is bordering on the Himalayas. If you were to draw a line, basically splitting the country in half, you have 96% of the population on the right side and only 4% of the population on the left. So, so China is really uneven in a lot of ways and the way that money has moved around the country, that development has moved across the country is really different. So uh, a tier city is basically referring to a stage of development as well as uh, GDP output. So how much production a certain city has. Um, it's often used as a sort of stand-in for understanding how developed the city is. The tier one cities are Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. Um, I actually had never lived in a tier one city until recently where I moved to Beijing. All of my time for the most part has been spent in tier two and tier three cities. Um, I think the biggest mistake that most people make is looking to Shanghai and tier one cities and expecting the rest of the country to follow suit. So a lot of people go to Shanghai, it's something I call the Shanghai fallacy, uh, and other tier one cities, and they interact with their translator, they, they sort of meet their cool 
uh, you know, study abroad Chinese friends who all speak great German or speak great English. Um, they drink great wine, they have a good steak, they maybe have a taco. Um, they read the brands that they recognize, they ignore the ones they don't, and they go home thinking that, wow, for China, modernization means westernization. If you go to tier two cities, you realize that there's a different sensibility. Um, and so I, I very intentionally try to, I try to stay mostly ensconced uh, within tier two cities uh, and tier three, tier three cities throughout the country, because that, that's a China that isn't um, as explicitly trying to interact with the rest of the world. Um, and I think is far more representative of the rest of the country. So if you're stuck in Shanghai, and I, I know probably some people are stuck in Shanghai right now, I'm sorry, uh, it just ain't very representative of the rest of the country, you know that, but the rest of the world ought to know that as well. Yeah, fair, fair enough. So let's go a little bit like, let's structure it this way, let's go through a, through a life cycle of a, of a Chinese millennial. You already started with this four, two, one uh, thing and told this, this cute little story of the, uh, let's go a little bit further to the school and, and high school age. Um, You also refer sometimes uh, to Chinese millennials as uh, test monsters. You already uh, mentioned this topic of like uh, maybe a lack of creativity or or innovation. Like how how do you think how does this test monster and learning by heart um, match with innovation creativity? Will this change over time? And uh, yeah, I, maybe you can absolutely. So this question of innovation and creativity. This this is maybe the most defining question of, of not just this young generation's life, but actually of the future of China. Um, China, the, the story of development in a lot of ways has been a lot of hands doing a lot of work for cheap, right? The 1990s, the early 2000s, China was basically, I mean, it had a massive population who was quite poor and extremely hardworking, uh, and they became manufacturers. It was incredible. Um, but you guys have seen sort of the demographics of China today this demographic pyramid, not very many young people, a lot of old people, can no longer support a manufacturing economy. So the one thing we know about this young generation is that they're not going to be making the world shirts. We've actually seen with COVID-19 response that you're already, I mean, it's basically accelerating a move from manufacturers to get out of China. Not everyone, because the scale that you can uh, get in China, and particularly in the higher tech, uh, the capabilities you have in China, are unrivaled anywhere else in the world. But for making shirts, for, for some of this uh, easier manufacturing, people are, are going south. So this question of creativity and innovation, look, it's already happening, right? Like, I, I don't know how many of you use WhatsApp versus WeChat. Um, it's a really easy example. There's about, I don't know, 20 to 50x more, more capability within WeChat than there is in WhatsApp. Um, my Chinese friends, when they travel to Europe, when they travel to the United States, they think we're backwards. That, that's the word that we, like it's cute when they travel and interact in our, in our, in our sort of technological ecosystems, honestly. Um, so while not everybody in China is very creative, a lot of, a lot of education is based around rote memorization, um, they're encouraging creative thinking and innovation in a way that just hasn't really happened in China for the last 20 years, because they recognize uh, that it's the key to their future. One of the ways they're doing that, by the way, is encouraging people to study abroad. A lot of people think about China as a cloistered country. They think about a government who's, who's worried about what the people are thinking. Why is it that one third of all of America's study abroad students come from China? Right, and these are the wealthiest. These are the most promising students. Uh, if China really cares about what their people are thinking, why are they sending the, those kids here? Well, the answer is because the Chinese education system doesn't really do a good job of creating innovators. Ours does. Germany's does. Australia's does. The United Kingdom's does. Uh, it's actually kind of the same as China in the 1990s. When China in the 1990s wanted to become a manufacturer no one in the country knew how to make anything because China missed an industrial revolution. So they imported the industrial revolution, took a lot of IP as they were doing it. They invited German manufacturers, American manufacturers, British manufacturers in. They provided the labor and over the course of the next 10 years, they kicked out the German bosses and now they're just, and now they're just Chinese companies. So 
when they needed a manufacturing boom, they imported one. Now they need a creativity boom and they're, and they're sending their kids abroad to get ensconced in that, in that ecosystem of, of international creativity and education. And then a lot of those kids are now going back. Um, if you look at some of the early innovators in China, most all of them studied abroad. You know, the founder of Baidu, the first time he, he touched a search engine, it was in upstate New York. Jack Ma obviously got rejected from everywhere uh, in the United States. It's a big part of his story. But the first time he encountered the internet was here in the United States. Um, Zhang Xin, one of the co-founder of Soho, uh, made her start in the UK. When you, when you look at these top, actually, by the way, even the person who made the hydrogen bomb and the hydrogen program is known as the two bomb brother in, in China. He studied and he learned these things at Purdue. There's a long history of, of looking abroad for some of those injections of creativity and innovation. Um, and especially now with the numbers of people studying abroad, they are going home and bringing a lot of that, um, that entrepreneurial know-how into the mix. I do think, by the way, and I, and I want to finish this point, um, right now you're seeing innovation parity. I would actually say most Western companies, and, and there's a lot of different metrics to measure this, there's still more innovation outside of China. I truly believe the defining difference between China and the rest of the world in terms of their innovation ecosystem is that it's not about the innovators, it's about the people who are using the innovations. So do you have an iPhone, Matthias? I do, I do. Do you use Apple Pay ever? I do not, I do not indeed. <laughs> it's right. not very so, popular in Germany at the moment. So 27%, Apple was really excited about this. 27% of iPhone users uh, have started to use Apple Pay. 27%, it's incredible. 97% uh, of smartphone users in China have either WeChat Pay or Alipay. So 27 versus 97, there's just a different willingness to use new stuff. And so if you're a creator, if you're an app maker, if, you're, uh, if you've got a new invention, are you gonna to go to the United States where we don't really like to use new things necessarily? Or are you going to go to China, which is willing to adapt and adopt at a speed we don't see other places in the world? Yeah, a excellent point, Zach. Um, you demanded some, some spicy questions, so one topic we should definitely address, and it's the topic of uh, dating, love, and sex in China. Um, you, you basically, in, in your book, I think four chapters are <laughs> around this topic. So let's um, may, maybe you can can just to start with um, outline the this clash of like traditional versus versus new like you cover being gay in the middle kingdom the the sex revolution you cover in your book um, also this marriage market and the parents expectations leftover women so maybe you can just bring all these things together and uh, yeah. give a brief Gosh, overview. Yeah, if I could on. do that, it would have been a much shorter book. <laughs> um, but I I can give you some high level stuff. So first, in a book about 20 to 25 year olds, if it's not about dating and sex, then you're, then you're missing a big portion of it, honestly. Uh, and so, especially as a foreigner, it's, it's difficult to write about these things without seeming gross, honestly. Uh, and so, but, but what's interesting, uh, a lot of the time when I was living in China, I was living in different places with a lot of young people around me. Just, you know, I was, I was kind of broke. And so one of the places I lived for actually a year, I had 25, Chinese roommates. And a lot of people don't realize this, but Westerners are seen as just being more sexually experienced. Um, porn is technically banned in China, and this is getting a little bit graphic, so if my grandfather is watching, I apologize. Porn is banned in China, uh, and, and so people don't make Chinese porn. If, if, you've, seen, uh, uh, if you've seen people of Asian descent uh, engaging in sexual activity in China, it's likely Japanese. So most of the porn and early visions of sex are from American movies and Western movies and Western porn, honestly. Um, and so a lot of people felt very comfortable asking me questions about sex and sexuality because they assumed that I was like this, this God of all knowing, uh, uh, right. So obviously not the case, but I ended up having a lot of really candid conversations uh, about sex with people all, all over the country, including China's leading sexologist, Li Yinhe. Um, the major difference between sex 30 years ago and sex today is that people are having it now. It's kind of that simple. It used to be that sex was not seen as a sin. Remember, China doesn't have religion. 
but it, I mean, it, it doesn't have mass religion. It's not, it's not native to its, uh, its culture, but it does have, um, it does have, it does have family and it does have a sense of purpose. So for a lot of young people, sex was always seen uh, as a part of marriage. So in 1989, only 15% of people uh, above the age of 18 had sex before marriage. You fast forward to today, 89% of people are having sex before marriage. So one major difference, people weren't having sex before marriage before, now they are. Second, um, there's a conflict between tradition and modernity. So it used to be in China that you had a lot of pressure on yourself to get married. Uh, but that also used to happen when you were 18. So I write about leftover women, which means shengnu, basically uh, women who are above the age of 27 who are unmarried. Uh, they're called shengnu, a leftover woman, to, to suggest that they're socially inedible. The idea is to pressure these women into getting married. Uh, it's terrible. And, I, and I've seen it built into the psychology of a lot of young women across the country. Um, so these women are basically being fed conflicting messages. On one hand, you should get married, you should have kids, um, you should settle down early. You're supposed to do all these things before you're 27. On the other hand, you're supposed to get educated. You're supposed to get a college education. You're supposed to get a graduate education to get a good job. Uh, and you're not supposed to date during this period of time. So suddenly you have these women who are 22 through 25 graduating from college and being told that they have two years or three years to figure out the entire, you know, love, dating, sex, and then marriage thing, uh, or they're called a leftover woman. So this is just one example of sort of the, the, the friction between tradition and modernity. You have two sort of tectonic plates, what it's often always meant to be Chinese, and then the pressures of the modern world, and they grind against each other. Um, this young generation, it's really interesting, um, gets to decide how those two tectonic plates kind of fit together. So what are the new standards of, of sex? Um, people are, are starting to have sex for fun. They recognize that it, it won't kill you. They recognize that it's not bad. Um, but they're also typically doing it in long-term relationships, much different than the hookup culture you see definitely in the United States. I don't know about Germany. Um, so a, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, cult, uh, sort of traditional ideologies are, are bumping up against the pressures of modernity. Uh, and, and they're finding new ways to fit together. Um, it's, it's a really interesting, interesting thing. What, one more thing on the LGBT community. Um, much of the Western world has issues with homosexuality because of religion. Uh, this idea that it's a sin uh, to, be, to be homosexual. Again, China doesn't really have religion, uh, or at least not, you know, actually around 100, over 100 million people are Christian, but it's not, it's not native to its, its population. Um, and so people's issue with, with being gay is typically just, how are you gonna make kids? So, you know, I, I, do, I do a pretty extensive set of interviews in, in the book talking about how the LGBT community is finding that if, if they're able to produce kids, it's actually, their parents will be really happy. So it's not necessarily an issue of sin, uh, it's an issue of, of a second generation. And so you have a lot of the LGBT community uh, looking into uh, either adoption or in vitro fertilization to define ways of, of, of basically being a good kid culturally and traditionally while also being true to themselves in terms of their sexuality. Cool. Uh, excellent. Um, Zach, thanks. So um, we're slowly but steadily approaching the, the 6 p.m. time and we already discussed before that we will do five minutes uh, later, but let's move on. I think there are many interesting topics we could talk about: work environment, uh, marketing trends, whatever. But let's move on a little bit to. Yes, I'm also cool to I, because I took extra time. I'm fine to stay longer. I know that people probably have places to go, but if you guys want to hang yeah, out and talk then, more after this, I'm cool to stay around for a little bit. Yeah, then let me say at 6 p.m. like briefly where you can find more information on your stuff, and then we will do like five, ten minutes uh, longer. That's um, cool. That's fine. So. Um, Let's talk a little bit about China and the world, and we have some participant questions on it. I, I just try to bring them together. Um, so I think that what it describes really good, the first chapter of your book is called uh, Organ Stealing, Prostitute, Meat, Languages, and Other Words Between China and the World. Yeah, so, so and, and some questions are a little bit on 
how we can increase mutual understanding, yeah, and, and how can we also sustainably get get um, rid of some of the prejudices um, on both sides, I think. Um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. Sure. So I, I say this as somebody uh, who's having a lot of issues with kind of every country I'm involved in at this point. I'm not crazy about the Chinese government. I'm not crazy about the American government right now. And I'm often caught between the two. And one of the things I remind myself consistently, uh, and I hope that everyone in the world can think about this, is that in the same way that many Americans don't want to be judged by our government, many people in China do not feel that their government represents them. So 95% of the news that gets written about China is about government. Uh, and if you're writing about the Chinese government, it's going to be bad. And so if the only thing that we know in Munich, in New York, in San Francisco, um, you know, in Stockholm, wherever you are, is what you see in the news, and it's all about government, it's all going to seem evil, it's all going to seem controlling, uh, and it's all going to seem adversarial. Um, New York apartments, everyone. Uh, and by the way, if, if you were to... If the only thing you were to know about the American government from, you know, I, I read a lot of international news, is about what our president tweets, uh, it would probably look, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be judged by that. So one of the first things I really try to encourage, and this is a big mission of Young China Group, is just to get people to work together. Like, I, I truly believe that the more, there, there's incredible opportunities for business, and I'm, I know it's, it's weird to think that business could be the savior of all of this, but the more, Matthias, the more people like you there are wanting to sort of work together with a Chinese, you know, a collaborator or who's interested in China on a personal level or someone who gets really into the music or the film, um, the more you get into these not government conversations, I think the healthier the, the international dialogue will be. Um, one thing I do want to note, though, is that uh, in only focusing on this government characterization of China, um, we have the tendency, at least in America, to focus on the really short term. Uh, what's happened over the last few years with our focus on, on the trade war, um, we focus on the sort of metrics that we care about. So in the United States, the trade war really matters. To our president, the, president the, the trade war really matters. To China, the trade war might be only half of what matters. So China cares a lot about two things, wealth and power. The Chinese government talks about fu wen qiang, uh, wealth and power consistently. Um, and so right now, we as a country are engaged in, in a trade war with China um, that China isn't really interested in winning in the, in the same way that we are. So over the last few years, this is an example of how not knowing the Chinese people, the spirit and, and, and what, you know, what their goals are, what they want, what they dream of, how that actually negatively impacts our ability to act on the world stage. Um, over the last few years, the United States has shrunk away from Asia. You know, we tore up the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, a lot of our allies in the area are wondering, you know, is America going to support us? Um, and so suddenly China, which was a kind of fragile global power, honestly, in, in, you know, as recently as three, four years ago, suddenly they have the opportunity while we're focused on the trade war, which is over here, they're having the opportunity to create a series of mutually, uh, basically de mutual dependencies throughout Asia and throughout Europe. Um, and so if we, in a place, only focus on what's important to us in America, it's the trade war, we're missing that there's a geopolitical spread. There's an intentional geopolitical enmeshing throughout China that's explicitly a goal of the country, uh, even if it doesn't matter to us in the short term. So, so I really encourage everyone who's listening right now to not just think about what's important to you, but what's, again, to sort of lift yourself self out of a seat in Munich and shift yourself to a sheet seat in China and look at what's important to, to Chinese actors, be they business collaborators, be they business competitors, uh, government, like wh whatever it is, if you're not thinking about the world through that lens, you are missing uh, massive strategic considerations. I actually think the best thing that our, our government could do in a lot of ways is just to sit, sit down and talk to just random people in China, uh, not because they had learned state secrets, just because I don't think most people in the White House have ever considered what the world looks like to people uh, within China, not just government, but the average person. And the average person's sentiment, by the way, has a massive impact on how the Chinese government acts. Uh, great answer. Like what, what I take away is basically take other perspectives and also like shift the conversation a little bit away from 
um, from politics, and I think uh, especially you are the, the stuff what you are doing is a great uh, contribution um, to this course. Uh, so much appreciated. Um, let's look a little bit. Okay, just a short question for in between. Why do young Chinese people love bubble tea so much? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Uh, and, and if you guys want to have a really philosophical debate or conversation about karaoke as well, I've done like a, an upsetting amount of research into why people love karaoke. Uh, and we could talk about this, but bubble tea, I don't know the answer to. I will say that, uh, you know, just to make it more serious, we like to focus so much on like how many Mercedes people's people in China like to buy and the luxury market and that's fine, but for, for most of the population, by the way, if you only have 10% of the population interested in the luxury market, it's still the biggest luxury market in the world. It's 140 million people. So get excited about that. But for the other 90% of people who, you know, remember the per capita GDP in China is around 10,000 bucks. These simple pleasures, the, the ability to eat out instead of eating in, the ability to have more meat in their diet versus, uh, versus not 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the ability to afford a bubble tea uh, and that simple pleasure to, to, to work into your 996 incredibly strenuous work day. Um, why bubble tea specifically? I wish I had a cooler answer. Uh, but I, I really think it's important to, to remember that these sort of simple pleasures and these small injections of sort of like kind of consumer induced happiness to, to get you through the drudgery of city life. Uh, really, really important. It might not be coffee for everyone who's watched Luck and Coffee basically implode. Uh, again, don't think modernization means westernization. People in China aren't going to love coffee just because we want them to. Fair, fair point. Um, and uh, good point. So, um, and also in two weeks, we will talk with Jeffrey Thousand about also the story of Haiti and the hype around Haiti. So guys, stay, stay tuned on this. Yeah. And let me briefly, if, if some of the people need to leave before, let me briefly just mention where they can get some more information and then we will continue with two or three uh, more questions. So uh, yeah, guys, you, you heard about the book and also the newsletter, just go on this website, Young China Group, or as I got um, aware of uh, Zach, just follow him on LinkedIn. There's also quite some cool stuff. And for all the others um, who already have to leave now, uh, thanks for participating in our event. We will have next week uh, a cool event on Myanmar and also a couple of other cool events in the weeks to come. You will get a feedback ma mail as always. So I would uh, appreciate your feedback so we can gradually improve uh, this format. And you will also get a YouTube uh, link to rewatch if you want to re uh, watch the remaining minutes. Please subscribe to our channel. Um, that being said, let's come back to the question. What else do we have? I actually have a, uh, have a question from Eva, and I think it's an important one. So she, I think she's a little bit critical toward what you presented. <laughs> she says uh, you compare the picture which looked like a rural scenery of 1969 in China and another one which showed Woodstock in the US at the same time. I would like to know what, how, how did Shanghai in 1969 look like? Sure. So, so uh, yeah. in 1980, actually, I'm going to go to 1990 again, just because that's when I was born. So not very long ago, um, the per capita GDP in China was 300 bucks, $300, 300 USD. So like, and, and by the way, during the Cultural Revolution, you're talking about millions of people dying. The, the Great Leap Forward, 1958 to 1961, 45 million people around died of starvation. So, so this isn't, it, it's not like there are parts of China that were quite poor and parts of China that were quite, quite rich. There's no doubt that the city centers were better off. But right now, when I, when I watch, I watch a huge amount of Chinese TV. Um, it, it does interesting things to my sanity over periods of time. But, it, you know, especially when I'm traveling, which I'm doing a lot less of, for work, it, I watch it on planes. When you see these portrayals of Shanghai, of, of of, of like the old China as being well off. It just not, it just wasn't the case. So while Shanghai was certainly better off and certainly more developed than rural China, um, the cultural revolution was defined by, by people moving away from urban centers toward being pushed into, into being an agrarian society again. So, so while I know that, you know, the, the picture I showed is definitely one uh, that is not Shanghai, uh, I would say that it's far more representative of 
of the sort of small pockets of relative subsistence leaning towards minor prosperity that you still have throughout the country. So, so I, don't, I, I think it's totally fair to say that pre-1980 China, really pre-1990 China, the vast majority of people were mired in poverty. And pre-1980 China, uh, it was primarily agrarian. Fair point. Um, let me ask one last real question, and then then we we do like a really rapid Q and A where you just say like a few words per, per questions. Like the questions are really easy. Often it's either or, so you will you will, you can do that. Um, so so let's let's do the last time a question. Um, so so in the in in Western media, especially we we kind of already tackled that topic. So on the, the media and politics are getting louder at the moment on both sides. Uh, business basically um, stopped um, speaking out against China, as you can see with N uh, NBA and and Louis Vuitton. So I would be really curious, like how can we constructively criticize China? And this is because I already asked last week another. Um, a speaker and I would be really interested in, in, in your view on that. And it doesn't really matter whether, whether we are in the position to criticize China. That's, I think, a different question. But, but if, if you, when you speak with Chinese people about um, the, the TTT or Hong Kong or whatever, um, and you have a different view, like what's important, like just meet them at eye level or, or, or what's, what's the important thing for you um, that nobody feels each other offended? Yeah, so I grew up in around Berkeley, California. Uh, my dad, as you saw before, was a big hippie. So, so I think good relationships are based on understanding, and good conversations are 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 based on listening. And what I find uh, is that what's most often missing. And by the way, I get people people talk. I, I am very openly critical of of, of the Chinese government in a, in a lot of ways. Xinjiang, um, some of the treatment in Hong Kong, not all. Um, and definitely what we saw at the beginning in, in Wuhan in terms of, you know, repress, suppression of information, egregious government failure, um, gross misuse of power that has, that has frankly resulted in something that, I don't know that could have been stopped, but certainly could have been contained to a, to a greater degree than what we're looking at. So like, let, let's be honest here. Like I, there are, there are, lot, there are large opportunities to, to criticize the Chinese government. I think what we're missing though is an understanding of young people's point of view. So what I find is most people who are very strongly against the CCP have, have never considered why is it that this young generation or even individuals with this young generation aren't. So you know why why is it that despite knowing many of what many of the issues that we cite in the you know this this, this young generation isn't dumb. They can, many of them can think for themselves. Um, many of them have studied abroad. Many of them have many more years of education outside of the country than they do inside the country. Um, most people don't ask, okay, what's, what's your point of view and why? And, and where, what am I missing here in, in my understanding? Um, so I, I would also say one other thing, um, and my dad tells this story, and I think he's on this. Uh, it, a lot of it's about how you approach a conversation. And this is like, I'm, I'm, this, you, could use this, you could use this advice with your wife. Like, I don't, I don't this isn't just China. Um, people adjust to your tone. My dad tells a story and he's gonna sound like the biggest hippie right now, but basically, Matthias, if you and I are both holding guitars and I hit the C chord on my guitar, uh, the C chord on your guitar is going to vibrate. It tunes together. And so if I come into this conversation looking for a fight, I'll probably get it from you. If you approach the conversation from a perspective of understanding, you get that too. Almost every time I give a speech, and I've given, I've given a speech in, I think, 15 to 16 countries at this point, there's always Chinese people in the audience, and they always begin as the most standoffish. They're sitting there looking pissed. Why is this white dude, honestly, why is this guy who's not from China talking about China for me? And at the end of it, they're always the most appreciative. 100% of the time they come up to me ask, uh, afterwards and say, thanks for doing this. I have not found a way to communicate this to, to, people, uh, to people who aren't from China. And which to me transmits this idea that we aren't doing a good enough job of listening. And, and the best way to be heard for your argument about the CCP to be heard is to hear, is to hear other people yourself. I think the NBA is a really good example 
um, you had American politicians out for blood. It, it be, Hong Kong became an issue of democracy and freedom or not. Um, if you know and understand the dynamics of Hong Kong, you understand it's not just about democracy and freedom. You, you understand that China and Hong Kong have a very different culture. Uh, you understand that, that Hong Kong has more or less been on the economic decline since 1997 when they went back to mainland China. You have young people who were born uh, in, in Hong Kong who in 1997, their, their, GDP, or their, their GDP was 20% of, of, of all of China's, now it's less than three. Uh, they used to talk about that backwater across the, across the way in Shenzhen. Shenzhen's grown 400x in population since 1990. Um, Hong Kong is, is on the decline. Uh, and there's also a group of young people who have never seen worse wealth inequality in their lives. Right now, the wealth inequality in Hong Kong is worse than it's been in 47 years. The average apartment is 125% of the average income. And so you have a group of young people, by the way, you see this around the world. It's not just in Hong Kong, you see it in France. Uh, you have a group of young people who feel like the promise that they were made when they were young the promise that they could, they could afford to live where they were born, that they could educate their children, and based on their education, which is accessible, they can get a job that can provide for all that. They feel that that promise has not been kept, and it's true, that promise hasn't been kept. Who, who has mismanaged our surroundings? The government, who controls the government? Beijing. And so when we look at it, it becomes a young people versus Beijing thing, Beijing thing. And I'm not trying to undermine the value of democracy and that many people want that. But the dynamics of Hong Kong do not get fixed, unfortunately, if the five demands that, that Hong Kong protesters were, were, were describing are, are met. And so from the United States, again, this is, this is through our lens, it's a democracy issue. But through when you talk to my friends in Singapore, it's an affordable housing issue. When I talk to my friends in Hong Kong, it's a, my home is no longer my home issue. Because in Hong Kong, you, if, I'm, if I'm in New York and rent gets too high, I go to Boston. If you're in Berlin, the rent gets too high, you go to Munich. It might be the other way around. Uh, there are around these pressure that. valves. <laughs> right, okay. So you, there are these pressure valves where you could leave and still feel like, you know, I moved from California. I moved from Beijing to Chengdu, uh, right? So, that, and, I, and I could still feel like home when I'm moving to smaller cities. There is nowhere else in the world as Hong Kong gets too expensive and out of reach for the people who live there. There is no other place in the world that these young people can go and it still feels like home. And so there's a desperation that, that I feel. There's a desperation that you can hear, um, but it's not as simple as just democracy. So again, you'd only know this by talking to people in Hong Kong extensively. I went to the University of Hong Kong. I know a lot of the protesters on the front line. Um, and you'd only know why people in China don't vibe, don't agree with the perspectives of this young generation in China, uh, of, of in Hong Kong, because yeah. again, I did extensive interviews. But, but listening to both a lot, then allows you to be heard as you'd be like, okay, well, here's kind of how we see it, and here's why we believe what we believe. Cool. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, so we are already 30 minutes over, so let's do the rapid Q&A because I really want to do this. <laughs> um, and, and, and then uh, let's call it a day. Um, this is rapid fire, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and we can actually also include one of the questions from the participants. So what are values of young Chinese people? Maybe you can just drop like three, four words. <sighs> This is such a hard question. I'm going to say I don't know. Let, let's take it at, 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 the, at, at the end. Yeah. Okay. okay fine. Uh, favorite food in China? Favorite food in China? Kaoyu. So barbecued fish, particularly from Chongqing or Chengdu. Favorite province or place to travel in China? Sichuan uh, or uh, Qinghai. One book about China one has to read except your own book. <laughs> Rivertown. It's the book that first made me love China. Peter Hessler, he's sort of the god that everyone who writes about China prays to. Three places you would bring someone um, if you want him to understand China. Chongqing, um, Shenzhen, and, um, and then my, uh, my best friend's farm uh, outside of Chengdu. Cool. Um, one thing you missed from the U.S. when in China. 
So I don't think of myself as a very typical American in a lot of ways, but after a month of being in China, this was when I was 22, I started to dream of hamburgers, which is, which is crazy. Like I, I was not a big hamburger guy. And in my first year, I couldn't afford Western food. I just, I was just pretty broke. So I was eating Chinese food my entire diet. After a month, I started to dream of hamburgers. So, uh, awesome. Let, let's do this vice versa. One, one thing you missed from China when in the U S the food and the, no, the food, it, this is such a, by the way, when people think about nationalism in China and why people want to leave Germany to go back to China, we talk about these big things, job opportunities, the economy, the government, but often what brings people back are really simple things like food. They want to be close to the food that they love, the family that they love, the language that they can express themselves in. Um, and the thing that I end up missing about China is just what I do three times a day, which is eat. And the food is killer. I truly do. I truly do not believe you can understand China if you do not get down with Chinese food. So much of the culture is obsessed with food, and so much of it is, it, you know, circles and orbits around food. I, I can clearly see your passion. Um, last three, last four one. TikTok or Instagram? On TikTok or Instagram. Um, I'm an old person, so Instagram. But TikTok is a better app. Way more addictive. WeChat Pay slash Alipay or Venmo? Uh, WeChat Pay, not even close. It's an entire ecosystem. Alipay is probably more secure, but. Cool, and let's, let's uh, stop with one thing the world should know about China. <sighs> most difficult one, probably. <laughs> Take your, take your time. You can make it as a closing statement. And, and yeah. I would say, um, first and foremost, big thanks to you, uh, Zach. I think we could talk for hours and hours uh, longer, but the participants are running away. Also, my flatmate is waiting for me. So no <laughs> uh, thanks for being our guest today. Um, again, all of you who want to learn about his work, I think there's uh, plenty of other interesting stuff in his book. So um, really support his work. Um, I can only encourage you to do so. And as I said, the, all the other things I already said, feedback mail you will receive one. We appreciate your feedback. Um, you will receive the link for the YouTube and we will have some other pretty cool events upcoming uh, visiting. Uh, check, it, check it out on aesmuc.de or for sex work, um, Young China Group. So sex, what's the one thing everyone has? I'm, I'm going to break the rules and do two things because I want to answer the values okay, question. If you, were to, if you were to ask people in the past, in China, and I've done this, I've done this interview throughout the country, does China have a religion? It's not really, does China have a belief? Um, the majority of people actually responded with the same answer, and it's money, honestly, um, which is disconcerting, but it's also kind of true. For a lot of years in China, what it meant to, what people were aimed at was just making more money. And the reason I say I don't know what young people's values in China are right now is because they're being created. Um, because it's the first time that this young generation is realizing that there's much more to life than earning, than working harder, than trying to just buy more and get more. And so I'm watching, you know, I call them the restless generation because they're an identity crisis. They're figuring out what their values are. Um, and, and that's a process that's being defined right now. If there was, um, if there was one thing I wish that the rest of the world knew about China, um, it's, it would mostly just be to remind people that the, that the individuals there are more than their government and, and, that they, and that they love their family, they're interested in their friends, they worry about their taxes and, and future uh, the same way that, that you do and that your family does and that your brothers and sisters do. Um, and to check in with that when you're upset with, with the way that uh, the Chinese government is, is, is exerting itself on the world. I think that's a very valid wish. Uh, I break my rule also because that just came in one last question. It's a very practical one. Hey, how, how would you prepare if you were to do, uh, if we were going on exchange in China starting in September? So besides watching our talks, obviously, and uh, checking out um, sex work, sex, do you have some, some final comment on that? Yeah. Make sense um, to look at I would say be clear about what your goals are. Uh, and depending on what your goals, for instance, my goal when I studied abroad in Hong Kong was to learn as much about China as I could. 
uh, but I didn't, I didn't speak the language then. So I read and I, I traveled and I tried to absorb as much as I can. When I moved back to China after I graduated from college, my goal was, was to, to really learn the language and get deep into China. Um, and so the way I prepared myself was I prepared myself to be really lonely and to cut off every other foreigner that I came into contact with. So, um, so yeah, it depends on which way you're going. If you're trying to learn the language, uh, learn, recognize that the, the best way to not learn the language is to hang out with people who look like you. Uh, uh, you know, the worst language, the worst Chinese speakers in a Chinese city are the people in your language class. So remember that. Um, but there's so much good writing and good reading on China. I would really recommend reading Chinese novels and starting to listen to Chinese music, um, read Chinese sci-fi and start watching Chinese TV shows. So just start to change your mental diet to consume things, the things you're feeding your brain to consume things from China itself. Yeah, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And to the participant uh, who asked this question, it's anonymous. I can, I can tell you, I've been on exchange in Shanghai by myself, and I can um, say that everything what Zach uh, said is totally true. Um, go out of Shanghai, uh, go along the old Silk Road or whatever, go Gansu province, and it's a, a really mind blowing experience. Uh, get that out. being said. Um, Zach, again, uh, thanks. I really loved our conversation and I hope uh, we stay in touch. Uh, to all the others, thanks for participating in our event. I hope um, to welcome you soon again. Take care of yourself um, and your loved ones and uh, have a great weekend. I'm sorry for taking my, more of your time if you like it. My thanks, fault. Sorry, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you to, uh, to your wonderful organization. And I hope to see you in Germany soon, everybody. Sure. Let me know when you're in Munich. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.